So um, b before we start, um, I'd like to um, make a couple of comments that um, this is an open and on the record meeting and that interested individuals and or members of the press have been invited to attend as observers. As you all know that this is a public open meeting. However, this is not a press conference and we will not entertain questions or comments from the floor at this time, but only reserve any remarks for the designated question and answer sessions. In addition, this is a civil discourse. Any signs displayed must be removed from the room, and those who disrupt the meeting will be asked to leave the premises. And um, I'd like to end with this and to thank all of you for your cooperation. So, Judy. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody had a nice, enjoyable lunch. Um, and I'd like to also welcome back our webcast viewers at this time. Um, this afternoon, we have a full agenda, as you'll note in your program. Um, and today's um, first afternoon speaker is Dr. Kathleen Pritchett Corning of Harvard University. And she's going to talk to us today about um, maintaining health status before, during, and after transport. He Thanks, Judy. I, I guess I'm not supposed to touch this. There's issues, so I'll, I'll just sort of lean. How about that? All right, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, at the behest of Dr. White and uh, health status before, during, and after transit. So what I'm going to talk about is health status, okay, not health itself. So if we define health as the basic bodily integrity and functioning of the animal, this is l less of my concern. I think uh, Lynn's going to talk a little bit more about actually maintaining the health of animals during transit. What I'm more concerned about is the exclusion of adventitious or infectious organisms from places where they're not wanted. So health status then is the presence or absence of various microbiologic agents uh, monitored in the animals of interest. Okay, so this is of obviously more concern in some types of animals than others. So for some laboratory animals, changing health status during transit is a big deal, right? They either are, I mean, it's not, it's less of a risk. Either because they don't have a tightly controlled health status, they're just, you know, animals of a certain ilk, or because they're vaccinated or otherwise conditioned or perhaps both. Or maybe the risks are actually taken by the humans. Theoretical risks are maybe taken actually by the humans that are transporting these animals. You know, the, in, way back in the 1960s, the Marburg outbreak, um, animals with measles or tuberculosis or, okay, I'm really reaching here, but rabies, uh, I'm, I'm reaching. So always look to the law first, though, when it comes to maintaining the health status of animals during transport. The national laws of, on import are there to protect agriculture and human health. They don't care if the mouse has parvo or pinworms or anything else. What they're concerned about is I agents entering into uh, to a country where they're going to have an economic or human health impact. So there are often exemptions from some of these required tests for laboratory animals. You know, you know that your laboratory mice haven't been exposed to rabies, so you don't have to prove that they're vaccinated. You don't have to prove that they haven't um, been, ex you know, that they haven't been exposed to rabid animals. But always be sure that your paperwork or statements that you enclose or health certificates that you enclose with these animals meet the legal and regulatory requirements outlined for each specific country where you're shipping animals. Um, so they meet these regulations for these countries. So the vast majority of animals transported for research today are mice and rats. And of that, it's probably mostly mice. Very few relative numbers of other animals are transported for research. So for these animals, health status is vital. Contamination with unwanted microbial agents can render the animals unusable for research, can have significant and long-lasting effects on receiving institutions, both in the, the actual costs of cleaning up these agents and rederiving animals and quarantines and other institutions not accepting animals from these places, and it just slow down science in general, and potentially affect the health of the animals in question. But most agents of concern for mice are very species specific. Now some places have it figured out. If you have enough money or you have enough time, oh. 
you just quarant you just rederive everything that comes into your facility. But most people don't really have that, you know, the unlimited time or space or money that that would take. So it may be difficult to do that. And so now we talk about the other ways we can help our animals stay uninfected during transport. So trust but verify. The health status of the animal is generally the responsible, generally res the responsibility of the consigner, the person who puts it out there for shipping, not the carrier. The carriers do their best, but it's going to be the responsibility of the uh, person who's shipping you the animals. If your carrier has door control of the shipment from door to door, as most of the major laboratory animal vendors do, then the risk is greatly reduced. But alas, this is, uh, as we've heard earlier in the morning, due to costs and logistics and other things, it's unlikely to be possible for, you know, research institutions and, and universities. So what's the risk? If you look at it from a hazard analysis and critical control point view, so HACCP, the risk is really unlikely to be to human health or the health of other species. Again, these agents that we're concerned about with research are species specific to mice and rats generally. But the biggest risk is that the animals are gonna somehow change health status during transport and infect animals at the receiving facility. So where are our critical control points, right? We've analyzed our potential hazards. Where are our critical control points? Well, packing, of course, transport to the shipping vehicle, car, car, car truck, I'm sorry, that should have been indented, shipping itself, the actual um, carrier itself, car, plane, truck, I put boat or train, although there's maybe some local movement of animals occasionally via ferry in some places. Train, it's really unlikely, but um, it, I suppose it could happen. And then the transport to ultimate, your ultimate destination, your final destination, again, a truck or a car, and then a cart as it's wheeled through your facility, and then unpacking. So research rodents are a very small percentage of rodents that are actually shipped. So m the majority of them are animals for the pet trade, the rats and mice, gerbils and hamsters that are produced by small or large pet producers, or animals that are being shipped as feeders, as sources of food for mice or for uh, animals that eat rodents, raptors and snakes and such. So the health status of pet and feeder producers, so these animals could be right next to yours on the plane, and the health status of the, of the um, pet and feeder producers is very different than the health status that we maintain for our animals in research. It's just generally not uh, a priority or necessary for them. They, they aren't doing the kinds of things that need those tightly controlled health statuses. So packing, always an important part of getting an animal, yeah, getting your animal safely from one place to another and maintaining their health status. This is not suitable. But we want to pack the animals appropriately. Not only do we want to pack the animals appropriately for their health and comfort, but we want to pack them in new containers. We know that those containers haven't held shipments of a questionable, prior questionable quality before. We want to verify the health status of the animals inside, and we want to make sure that our crate is in really good condition, that it's going to be up to the job of protecting the health status of those animals. We also need to consider stops along the way. So a, a crate that you may feel comfortable shipping the animals across town in, you might not feel comfortable shipping the animals across country in. You know that they're gonna be in that crate for a lot longer when they go cross country. And the mixing shipments, which I mentioned before. So you transport to your primary carrier. So this is, you know, as it leaves your facility. It should be climate controlled, as we've all um, talked about before. It should preserve the integrity of the shipping crates. So it shouldn't allow the crates to jostle or bump up against each other. Ideally, it would avoid cross-contamination between crates and between shipments, although that's not always possible. The carrier movement of animals is the one of the bigger risk um, scenarios, the bigger uh, points of risk here. The lower risk, as we said earlier, is the carrier controlled door to door. So again, many of the larger animal vendors can do this. They just put the animals on their own dedicated trucks and they come to your loading dock and they've never been out of the control of the vendor during that time. So they have um, climate controlled vehicles and ultimate control of what's on those trucks. If it doesn't meet the health standard of what the other animals in the shipment have, then those animals aren't allowed to go on that truck. 
The higher risk in the way that most of us ship animals is a secondary carrier, so a courier to the airport, uh, the primary air carrier, and then again a secondary carrier, another courier as it gets from the airport to your facility. So there's stops along the way there. There's stops at um, holding facilities and other places, and maybe even at other pickups. So what's next to your animals during that time? This is what we're trying to avoid, right? We have our, our unhealthy animals here, and they are next to our nice, healthy animals. And somehow, we wind up with this, which we don't find out until much too late. Uh, you know, next quarter in our uh, <laughs> health monitoring program. So at this point, usually the animals have been packed somewhere. They've been in a holding, a uh, uh, freight holding facility somewhere. So although the airline cargo hold should be considered sort of shared microbiological space, it's not really rodent harborage. Okay, animals, rodents don't generally live in the bellies of 747s, not for very long anyway, not with, uh, you know, with the way that uh, the planes are cleaned up and managed. This, however, has the potential to be a really good um, rodent harborage kind of situation. And it's not necessarily that your rodents are going to be affected by this, but maybe the shipment that sat there for a couple of days before it got on a plane is the one next to your rodents, and that's the potential issue. So this is actually a photo from a real estate site of a, um, it's an air freight um, warehouse in uh, Czechoslovakia. So. But you can see that big empty space. That in itself is not great rodent harborage. But there's been, there was some nice work done in the 1960s by a guy named Crowcroft. And he was a British scientist who was tasked with managing food supplies for post-World War II Britain. And he, <laughs> he studied how the RAF was storing food. And this was food for humans, because the food for humans was the most important thing. They wanted to reduce the amount of rodent wastage as much as possible. So when you look at how mice move around a big empty warehouse, mice are thigmatactic. They want to stay at the edges of the facility. They don't venture. This, these were food and water and nesting sites. They generally don't venture to the ones in the middle because they don't feel safe. However, when you stack freight very neatly and in a very orderly fashion and you follow what the mice do, well, you've just made rodent paradise with all these places for them to hug next to each other. So again, it's probably not that your crates, not always, that your crates were next to something, you know, another shipment of, of rodents, but they could have been next to something that was good harborage, okay? And that's how um, your crates got dirty. Finally, we have the transport to the, well, not finally, but the next step is the transport to the ultimate destination. Again, we want climate controlled. We want to preserve the integrity of the shipping crates. We want to avoid cross-contamination, especially between crates and between shipments. And then unpacking. And this is really the crucial step, right? We need to make sure when we receive animals that the integrity of the crate is maintained, that the crate is disinfected properly, and that we enter the crate in a way that maintains the disinfection and maintains the integrity of the crate. So quarantine or not, well, that's up to you and your institution. Uh, a lot of places quarantine everything. Some places quarantine, you know, have a most places have a list of approved vendors where they know that the vendors have control of the shipment from start to finish, and so they accept those animals without reservations and quarantine other animals. And again, as I said earlier, some places just rederive everything and don't want anything to do with any sort of risk. And I'm going to tell you a little story from uh, times past. So at a, at a facility that I used to be involved with, we had a chronic recurring mouse parvovirus outbreak in an SPF immunology facility. And it was associated with certain vendors, but the vendors weren't infected. And <laughs> everyone's always like, yeah, it's always the vendors. No, no, the vendors, the vendors weren't lying. The vendors weren't infected. So something was happening on in the shipments. So seasonally, we saw these outbreaks three years in a row, late fall, early winter, so that meant that every year we got parvovirus for Christmas, which was just great. <laughs> the shipment mode, this institution, very few animals arrived by dedicated truck. Mostly they arrived by plane and then courier. 
and to, to you know put the proper amount of mea culpa in there the facility handling of the crates could have been better okay so the best guess for the source of this outbreak had to do with sort of rodent biology in the fall and uh, early winter the animals come inside so they go from the outside where it's cold why would they stay out there into nice warm relative and warm is a relative term right when you're an outdoors mouse into nice warm inside sorts of places so in those pla in those uh, places like airline shipping holding facilities we would find that our that the um, the, the animals are palletized right before shipment and the pallets usually had shipments from vendors that shipped in plastic crates on the bottom and vendors that shipped in cardboard crates on the top the outbreaks were always associated with vendors with plastic crates so um, when the animals were palletized the plastic was on the bottom and I don't recommend you actually palletize it in this fashion with them all wrapped in plastic and stuff they're not going to arrive at their destination in good condition but what we think was happening was that we had those that wild rodent incursion or feral rodent incursion into the animal facilities and they would move around on the bottom parts of the crates because the bottom crates were more sturdy the animals were obviously that belongs in the bottom and the, the flimsy cardboard belongs on the top and they would leave behind presents for their jet setting cousins so we would receive the crates and again the mea culpa is that we were using a lot of quaternary ammonium compounds and not what we probably should have been using which was chlorine dioxide so once we moved to managing all plastic crates all crates not and plastic crates especially with stronger disinfectants this recurrent seasonal outbreak of parvovirus stopped we didn't see it the, the following year so to sum up, there is a risk of health status change during transport for lab rodents because you can't always control what's next to your rodents. You can't control for all the risks inherent in your transport and transport, but you can take uh, precautions on arrival to protect your facility. All right, and actually that's it. Thanks very much. Thank